here we are in the ball field, cornfield in the background, the field of dreams with Kevin Costner. As you look around here, and you've only been back twice in the quarter century since the film was made, what do you think? Well, you know, I had a feeling when I read the script the first time that it was beautiful, that it, it had a little gold dust on it, meaning if we could do this right, we might have a very special movie. But you didn't, I didn't know that, um, and that's actually the power of movies. Sometimes they can be about things you never, ever forget. And what happened with this movie, this simple thing about the difficulty fathers sometimes having talking with sons, almost a biblical thing, got wrapped up in this little movie in this corn. It just seemed perfect. Mm -hmm. um, and so 25 years later, uh, the corn will grow and uh, people will play here and it'll be just as perfect for them. So it's a real reason to try to pick your movies carefully because they can live forever. James Earl Jones as Terrence Mann is in fact a stand-in for J.D. Salinger because the real J.D. Salinger didn't want any part of the outside world. And as I remember, J.D. Salinger always felt that the movies would bastardize his work. How did W.P. Kinsella, who wrote Shoeless Joe, feel about Field of Dreams? I think he felt really great about it. Um, I can't speak for it exactly. I heard that he had. There, he might have exception with something, but, but boy, it would be really hard to argue with the results. And I say that not tongue-in-cheek because sometimes a movie is terrible and makes a lot of money and then you say to the mm -hmm. author, well, you should be real happy. And an author who's an artist goes, I'm not. I don't care if it made a zillion dollars. I can't imagine Ray not um, uh, feeling great about what we did here because uh, his book was really honored. And that moment in time and, and uh, turned into a universal story that's... Uh, they're probably not going to remake this movie. Yeah, I doubt it. You know, I can't prove this, but I'd be shocked if sales of Shoeless Joe, which had come out years before, didn't skyrocket after Field of Dreams. Without a doubt, that happened too. I mean, I remember leaving this field after this movie, and I said uh, to the owners, I said, I don't know if I'd be too sure about tearing this field down. I didn't imagine this. But I remember absolutely articulating this. I wouldn't be in a hurry to, to tear this down. There, there's something here. There's something unique. I, I wouldn't be too quick to, to get rid of this because there was something, and you've heard me say this word now three or four times, perfect. But, you know, it takes a game we love and it puts it right into a cornfield backed up by a mid-American house that's just trying to get by. And, and, um, you know, I miss the term hardball. You say baseball, but I remember just saying, let's play some hardball. Yeah. And that's, that's where it's played, by guys who played it better than anybody else. What one or two encounters, and I'm sure there have been thousands, but what one or two stand out the most with people coming up to you and saying, this is what it meant to me, or this is what happened to me when you asked your dad to play catch? Th th those th those stories are in the thousands now, I'll tell you, but and and one doesn't seem more powerful than the next, but I, I did have a, a man come up to me and say, you know, I, I, I sat at my dad's bedside as he was dying for the last two weeks, and we just watched that mo movie every day and every night. And um, he didn't feel like he wanted to watch anything else, and we cried at the same moment every night, uh, and every day and um, he said he said you know thank you uh, for giving that you can't go back to Chicago and put on a period costume and be Elliot Ness but you came back yeah. you're right here here we go yeah I mean you know, you go there you got to gun people down but uh, this this you know the corn was about almost seven eight feet high really at the end of the day and we watched it grow through the course of this movie and as we drove in, you know, you and I drove in together, and I just couldn't help think that I saw that every day because we were willing this corn to be where it needed to be for those guys to disappear. And this, this whole cycle here just replays itself, just like the people that will continue to come out here with their children and kind of throw the ball. It just... A bit like baseball itself. It keeps renewing itself. It goes on and on. Yeah, you know, and, and the, the biggest names in sports have somehow found themselves drifting here.
maybe something early in the 25 years, eh, thrill to drink. But there's some, a little bit of a mecca here. It's, it's certainly not Yankee Stadium. It's not Fenway. It's not Wrigley. But there's something simpler about this thing, and there's a, there's a gentle call to come here. That covers it. You guys have your catch. We're done. We're spending the weekend in Dyersville, Iowa for the 25th anniversary of Field of Dreams, which explains why yesterday, when we taped part of this, we were in different clothes. We changed clothes. We thought hygienically it was the right thing to do. <laughs> and so we continue. Joined now by Timothy Busfield, who played Kevin Costner's brother-in-law, the skeptic. Of course, he can't see the ghost players. You couldn't see the ghost players until later when you became convinced. But one thing you were convinced of was that he was going to lose the house, going to lose the farm, and he'd already lost his mind. Yeah, it was a, you know, it was a, it was a bad guy whose who's, uh, objective was based in love. He, didn't, he was confused by the whole thing. It just didn't make any sense. On a normal day, he would be partying with these guys and having a good time, and now he had to take the family position of, of thinking that they were, they, were, they were missing it. So it was a, it was a, 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 fun, a fun angle on, the, on, a, on a bad guy. You guys were young actors, relatively speaking, at that time. You'd go on to do great things, 30-something West Wing. That's all in your background. But when you step on a set with Burt Lancaster or James Earl Jones, that's a whole different deal, right? For me, I mean, it was, you know, Kevin had worked with, with uh, Connery, and I, I was picking Kevin's. I mean, Kevin was at that time, you know, let's not take Kevin out of the mix. For no Way Out was already one of my top ten favorite films. I think it's a perfect film. Uh, 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 Bull Durham was already, uh, I thought, one of the best baseball films and maybe one of the best ever. And so uh, to work with Lancaster, who I would imitate as a kid, uh, you know, I'd, I'd, I just, I would they'd give me money. My brother would give me a nickel and say, go ahead. And, and then the, to be able to hang out, and Bert would say, you know, he'd come on the set and he'd, he was hot and he was not working yet. And nobody knew what was happening. He'd come out in full clothes. He was old school. So he'd show up and get in wardrobe and makeup and then come sit where the director could see him as if to say, I'm not working. Uh, that's you brought me out here. So I'd go sit next to him and he'd say, I like you out there, I'm making faces. I played the bad guy Vera Cruz. I stole the picture. <laughs> and he was just, he, he would tell all kinds of good stories. Some of them I can't share here. Uh, was he a little yeah. off color at yeah. that stage? A little bit. Yeah, 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 yeah. At 75, but he was hot. You know, he was just, he was just in wool and it was 100 degrees. And, and James Earl Jones was, you know, everybody brought weight. But for me, honestly, it was Kevin as much as anybody just because uh, I, you know with Silverado on I just thought this guy is, re is a, w a really good reader of scripts and he's not making mistakes and and uh, and what he brought to the set and what he brought attitude wise and there's a lot of athlete in me and when somebody shows up as a team leader uh, and and never complains about work and is there to make things work out and his understanding of the text is so much better than most actors a lot of actors take parts based on on, on oh, this, this director and that actor and this much money, so I'm in. Uh, and it was clear Kevin was taking them based on the quality of the scripts and stories. So I was really impressed with him. You know, some people said at that time, wait a minute, Kevin Costner, who looks good as a baseball player, has just done Bull Durham, a perfect baseball film on its own terms. Why do a second straight baseball movie? But this is not, it's, yeah, it's about baseball, sure, but it's about a whole lot more. Well, you know, I have, you know, people get to see the movie in the theater, obviously. I have this one moment where I see it in its, in its infancy, in its virginal quality, if you will, and I'm on the couch reading this, and I thought, what a wonderful movie, and I, I wasn't going to be able to do it. I read it, and I said, you know, I can't do it. I was going to do a movie called Revenge, and that movie kept getting postponed. A month went, two months. Finally, I, I said to Revenge, if you don't make up your mind, I said, I'm going to go do this little movie in the corn. And uh, the first word out of the producer's mouth, he goes, I'll sue you. And I said, you know what, do it. And three days later, the water's kind of settled. And he said, I have an answer. And I go, what's that? And he goes, you do it after, my, after, my, after that, you do my picture. And I said, you're a smart guy. You fixed it. And that was the truth. I wasn't going to get to do this movie. But um, they pushed me so far to a point. I said, you know, there's this little movie that I really like, and they want me 
And I said, I want to be in it. And I said, and it's got to do with corn. And this guy just blew up. He said, what? Corn? And I said, yeah, corn. And I'm going to go do this movie. And that's how it happened. And then you went and did Revenge. I, re I Three days later, I, I, I owed him, so I had to go do it. Fair to say Field of Dreams kind of resonates more than Revenge. It does. It's a movie that does that, that weird thing. And we have movies, you know, the proof of movies that have stayed with the American psyche, you know, Wonderful Life, uh, Wizard of Oz, or, you know, I mean, you can really go down. And I'm, 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 I'm not talking about 100 movies that could be on that list. But when it comes down to the ones that stick with you, if, if that list is five deep or ten deep and Field of Dreams isn't on it, there, then that's, there's something wrong with the list. Here's part of the proof. Look over your shoulders. All the, the fathers and sons and daughters playing catch. They have their own backyards or their own parks across the street. But it means something different to them to play catch here. Yeah, it holds a, there's a, there's a, a magic to this field that wasn't there when we were shooting. You know, this was just a film location when we were shooting. Uh, and it was a tough location for the heat and the flies. And, and uh, what has happened is it's become this place that even I'm affected by in a different way than, than when I was filming. It, it's, you can feel it out there. You can feel the film out there. You know, you know, I went to play catch out, um, out there yesterday. I wanted to take my kids and we, we played a little bit of, we played a little catch. I couldn't help but notice, not children, but there was grown men at the end and they all had their gloves and they were just watching. I said to my son, I said, I'm going to play catch with these men. And he looked up and he said, all of them? <laughs> and I said, I said, well, let's see what happens. And he went over and sat down and I pointed at one guy and I threw to him and after eight or nine catches, he stopped himself and he gave another man a turn. They figured out their own thing out there and one by one I probably played with 30 guys. Thank you for watching your Improbable Podcast. Hit that like button, swing at the subscribe button, and hit a home run on that notification bell. Have a probably awesome rest of your day.